So yeah, this is uh, writing simpler ASP.NET Core. Come and join the not so solid crew. There's a reference to a pop band 15 years ago, so it shows how downward kids I am. Uh, thank you to the team at DDD Scotland for putting this on. Uh, this is my second time in Scotland. The first time was when I was about seven or eight, and we came for two weeks. After seven days of torrential rain, my father decided to drive home. So good to see it's still raining today. Did anyone read my profile before coming to this talk? Good. You still came? Okay. Yeah, so I asked uh, Twitter to write my profile uh, for this talk, and this is the response I got. So, Mr. Sachs, Colin, are you here? Uh -huh. Jay Channon, he's all right, but he smells a bit. Couch for sale. Not sure if that's still for sale or not. Judge Dev, MVP, architect, Twitter complainer, GitHub enthusiast. NT Coding. Johnny Chanson, a world-class village idiot with deep expertise in circumventing the best features of type-safe programming languages. In addition, he is literally a canon. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, Morks, outsourced solar of BIOS. Correct. Uh, Dan Barrett, possesses all five fingers on each hand, leading one to suspect he's not really from around here. He's not so bad once you get to know him. Said no one ever. Chris uh, Lewis Rudge, knows his shit. Well, I'll let you judge that. Um, I thought I'd put my own in. Got into open source, got a child named after him. Isn't that right? Christian. So those of you who don't know Christian Halang, he contributes to pretty much everything in .NET. He also contributes to Nancy, uh, which I also contribute to. I like to think him and I working alongside. He gained a lot of respect for me and wanted to name his first child after me. But, well, that's what I'm sticking with. Anyway. So, here's a proper grown-up <coughs> bio. My name is Jonathan Shannon. I am a software developer. I contribute to Nancy. Uh, I wrote the OmniSharp Sublime plugin years ago. I am the author of Botwin, which you will learn about today. Microsoft ASP.NET MVP, husband, father, and all around nice guy, honest. I work for a company called VQ, so thank you to them for all funding my traveling expenses today. If anyone's after a remote working job, then come and see me. If you like Buzzword Bingo, we use all the latest stuff, so you'll be in a good spot. If you want to see my code, it's on github.com slash jchannon, and Twitter is twitter.com jchannon. Sorry, can I get you with this one as well? It's actually quite quiet, that's all. No worries. Double mics. Okay, so who uses Solid in their web applications? Hopefully most people. So Solid has been around for 10 years or so. Most developers use this pattern. They tell other people to use this pattern and they copy and paste it from every project that they start. It's kind of ingrained, I think, in most web developers' development process that they don't really question why they're using it. In fact, Microsoft have recently written some architectural guidelines on maybe it's modernizing .NET applications, writing ASP.NET Core applications in Docker. Whatever it is, the underlying theme is actually still solid. So who has seen a service class that looks something scary like that? Yes, me too. I worked on an application with that, in fact. Um, I ran some dot trace profiling on this application, and the one area it picked up was being slow was reflection. I thought to myself, we don't use any reflection in our code, what's going on? I looked at it more and it said, the constructors in your application are taking a long time. I was like, aha, I know what that is. That's my IOC container being slow, because effectively what your IOC container is doing is using reflection to create the types that your current type wants. So, what did we do? We swapped our IOC containers. Simple. That was the quick answer, and it did actually help. But then we looked at how we were using our service classes. 
we analysed what they were doing, these dependencies. Were they being used in one method or were they being used in lots of methods? So what we actually did is took the S out of solid and created very specific classes where the dependencies were used only for where they were needed. So we consolidated that. We consolidated any uh, code behaviour. Rather than abstracting it for the sake of it, we tried to keep it very specific. And obviously with that, keep it simple. So this is going to be quite a uh, code-heavy talk. We are going to go from a typical solid application. We will then move to a mediator type application. So mediator is a library written by Jimmy Bogard, which allows you to consolidate your behavior into classes and only use your dependencies where you need them. We'll then go to a my mediator approach where we remove that dependency on mediator. We will use our own essentially. And then the magic bit at the end is where we remove our IOC containers and our mocking libraries. So as Chrissy said, why would I want to sugarcoat things? The biggest problem in dev these days is that demos that contain only 10% of the code you'll need when going for a production ready system. So this demo is a fully functioning application. It's up on GitHub. So I'd suggest you go and have a play with it. Um, it's quite large, so we probably won't go through all of it, but hopefully the key parts. So, everybody see that? Yes. So our demo is written for an API which returns film information, essentially. So here's our traditional web application. We have our controllers folder, our repositories folder, and our services folder. I think probably a common design for most web apps. We then have our controller. It injects a film service. Then when we want to go and get our list of films, it calls the film service dot list films. When we want to get our film by ID, it calls the film service list film by ID. If no, return a 404, otherwise return the film. When we do a post, it does some model validation. If that fails, it returns a 400. Otherwise, it calls out to the film service create film method. Does some exception checking and returns different status codes. Similar with updating a film, pass it out to the film service, and the same with delete. So if we look at what the film service is doing, is it's calling straight to the film repository. It's just passing it through. No real reason for that. But our film service takes four dependencies. It then takes a film repository, a director service, a cast member service, and a permission service. In our list films, we're only using one of those dependencies. If we look at list film by ID, that calls the film repository list film by ID method. That then calls to the director service list directed by ID. If we look at that, that just passes through to a director repository, which calls list director. And in this example, it just returns a director. Obviously, you would probably have some SQL there, but we've got lots of layers. If we look at the cast member service, that also calls out to a cast member service, which then goes to a repository and then returns an array of cast members. Okay. Create film. So this uses the permission service to validate the user. If that fails, it throws. If all is well, it will do some special mega core business validation and then pass out to the film repository create film method but it's only using two of the four dependencies. Update film is very similar. It also calls the list film by ID method on the film repository, updates the properties, and then calls the film repository update film. Again, the delete checks the user and then calls the repository delete film. Now, how would we test something like that? Typically, you would probably create an in-memory web server with your application. You would then create a load of uh, fake for your um, dependencies. You would say, if list films is called, return this. If this method is called, return that. So if we look at a test, 
it calls the client, gets the client, executes the request, and then asserts that the good fellas is returned. And this is how we've told our fake to behave. Should get filmed by ID, very similar. Calls the client, gets the API. We already told the fake to return Blade Runner, and we ascertain that that works. Now what we could do, let's have a look at this one actually. So on a, on a post, we are still testing the pipeline, but we create a film with no name. We post that and check that we get a 400, testing the validation has done its job. But let's try and make our service and repositories a bit cleaner. Let's consolidate those. So here we have our mediator application. This time, I've created a features folder. So rather than having controller services repositories, we have features. So we have our permissions, cast members, directors, and films. If we look at our <laughs> films folder, we still have our film controller, but then we have our kind of methods in separate folders again. But if we look at the controller, nothing has changed that dramatically. Instead of a service that's injected, we have a mediator which is injected. To get our films now, we create a list films message. We pass that message to mediator, and that then returns an iNuber of film, which hopefully you can see. The way mediator works is you create a, a message, and it then knows that there's a message handler for that. So if we look at our list films here, we've got our list films message handler, and we return our, our array. We haven't gone through three layers of services and repositories. We've gone straight to a class whose responsibility is to return that data. If we look at our list film by ID approach, again, very similar. We create a message, send, send a message. If the film is null, we return a 404, otherwise we return the film, as, you know, as we did before. In our list films message by ID handler here, we inject our list film ID query, our get director by ID query, and our get cast by film ID query. But we don't inject the permission service or equivalent. We don't need it in this place. We did in the service because it was a one large class. But the method to return that film is the same as what was in the service. We go and get the film, we get the director, we get the cast, we then assign those properties, and away we go. Same with the post, looks pretty similar before, does some model validation. If it fails, it returns a bad request, otherwise return, it goes and creates that film. If we quickly look at that, the only thing we have here is the valid user query. We've now separated that out. It executes that, if it fails, it throws, otherwise it does some special mega core business validation and saves the database in here. What it returns here is a unit, the mediator doesn't have the concept of a void. You have to return some sort of arbitrary object. So testing a mediator project looks a bit like this. Again, we have our films, our features folder. We have our controllers. Again, sorry. Again, we have our in-memory web server, but we also have a fake mediator. Although we've consolidated it, we're still gonna fake the mediator. So when the fake mediator list films message is called, it returns an array of films. Again, we execute the API request. We then ascertain that Goodfellas was returned. The same with get film by ID. That then returns Blade Runner. And we ascertain that that's happened. It's all very similar to what was there before. For example, if we post a, a film with no name, we assert that we've got 400 because the validation has failed. If we actually pass in this one, we create a film message, we pass in a valid film, but we say here, throw, a, throw an exception, we then got to assert that our logic returns a 403. So we're kind of getting there in consolidating our dependencies. But now we want to remove that mediator dependency. 
because having lots of dependencies on your code is not ideal. So this is some pretty hairy looking code, but essentially it's doing what Mediator does. It goes and finds your handler classes and executes them for you. So if we look here, we still have our features folder, but this time we have a films module, not a controller. Those of you who know Nancy FX uh, will hopefully recognize the routing. If you don't, I suggest you can have a look at Nancy. It's an alternative to MVC. This is a talk on ASP.NET Core, not ASP.NET Core MVC. So if you don't know Nancy or Botwin, then please go and take a look. But essentially what it does is allows you to define your routes in line and then how you execute that route next to it. That's essentially it. Botwin is a take on Nancy. It steals its um, routing concept, but it sits directly on top of the ASP.NET Core pipeline. It uses the ASP.NET Core routing underneath. I've just done some magic to tweak it. But anyway, this project without Mediator in it still does the similar thing. We go and get our films. We create a list films command. It was list films message before. Naming is hard. Call it what you'd like. But we create the command. We tell the handler that we've injected to list the films. It expects an innumerable of film and then write the films out as JSON. Listing a film by ID. We create a list film by ID command. We then take the ID from the root and we cast it as an integer. We then execute that. If the film is null, it returns a 404, otherwise it returns some JSON. Posting is slightly different. There's no automatic um, model binding. So you explicitly call bind and validate. So this will bind your request body, validate that based on fluent validation rules. If the validation is not valid, it will return a 422. It will then do some content negotiation and return some errors. Otherwise, you pass in the result.data, which is the bound type of what you passed in. And if all is well, it returns a 201, otherwise a 403. Similar when updating an object, does some model validation, returns, etc., etc. So hopefully that's not too different than what we had before. So, I've got all three of those types of projects in production. I then had a new project come up and I'd heard people talking about not using IOC containers, not using mocking libraries. And in my head, I was confused. How, how are you going to do that? The only way I could think in my mind was something that would result in a big mess. But then I read a blog post by Mike Hadlow so Mike Hadlow is the author of EasyNetQ, which is a RabbitMQ library. Uh, I think he also runs Brighton's .NET user group. Um, so yeah, go, go check it out. But he gave this example. He said, you have a customer data interface, which returns an I enumerable of customer from a get customers for customer report method. You then have a report builder interface which returns a report from a create customer report method. You then have an I emailer interface which has a send method in it. You would implement it something like that. You'd return an I enumerable of customers. Your report builder implementation would create the report with the customer's email. And then for demo purposes, your I emailer would write to console out. How you would then use those pieces of code would be something like this. You have a reporting service which injects those interfaces. And then the method run customer report batch calls your customer data get customers for customer report method. It loops over those customers. It then calls your report builder, create customer report, and then calls your email.send. 
all seems fine, right? You would test it like so. You would create mocks or fakes of those three interfaces. You'd create an expected customer with an email address and a report body. You would then set up your fake or your mock to say when get customers for customer report is called, it returns that expected customer you created. Your report builder mock, you set up and say, return this report object with the expected customer I created earlier. Now I create my reporting service, which is what we're testing, pass in those mocks, run that method, and then assert that the emailer mock had its send method called. That's fine, I think we all probably use something similar. So who likes statics? <laughs> I know I didn't a while ago. They mutate global state. They're hard to test with. But this is exactly what Mike was suggesting. And this is what he proposed. A static method called run customer report batch, similar to what was there before in the service class. But instead of having a class, you're passing your dependencies to the method directly in terms of funks and actions. But if you look at the body of that method, it's exactly the same as what it was before. You call your get customers for customer report dependency. You then loop over those customers. You then call your create customer report. You then send the email. It's exactly the same. In your test, you would create your expected customer, you'd create your expected report, but instead of creating a fake something which returns an I innumerable of customers, you just assign a func. You just say this func equals this and it returns an array of expected customer. For the create customer report, also a func. You assign that and tell it to report, return that report when it's executed. For the email, it's an action. But here we store some uh, variables, but we then call this functional.runCustomerReport batch. We pass in those funks and actions, and then we assert the response. Very similar, but no mocking libraries. So here comes the fun stuff, demo time, of how we put this into a web application. So again, we've got our features folder. We have our films module. OK, so this is still using Botwin. But instead of inlining the, uh, the root handlers, I've created methods. So when you call this.get, it calls this.getfilms. And that's what we've got here. So what this does is calls out, calls out to a class called root handlers .list films handler. That handler's returned. We then execute that handler. And then we write the response of that handler as JSON. That handler is a func, which returns an I enumerable of film. So let's go and look at what that root handler looks like. So essentially, it's a load of function actions. In our static constructor, our list films handler is assigned to a func which calls list films root dot handle. If we go and look at that, it returns our films. It's very similar to what we saw before, <coughs> apart from it's static. But you would still, in production, have something here which connected to a database and returns your films. List film by ID root gets a bit more intense, but essentially list film by ID handler is a func which takes in an int, the ID, and returns a film. This then calls list film by ID root dot handle, which requires a film ID. It returns a func to take in a film ID and return a film, so it's a list film by ID essentially. It has a func which takes in a director ID and then is expected to return a director, and then a cast member func, which takes in an ID, and it returns an I enumerable of cast members. Now here you would probably wire up some SQL 
for your dependencies here. If you think of this class as your program.cs where you would normally wire up your dependencies, then we're kind of talking about the same thing there. If we then go and look at that list filmed by root ID, it looks very similar to before, doesn't it? It takes in the ID, it calls the list film by ID query, or whatever you want to call it. It returns that film. If that then returns null, it returns a null. The module will then return a 404. It then does the get direct by ID, assigns that, get cast by film ID query, returns your cast, assigns it to the film, and returns. But this is all static, and your dependencies are passed in on the handle method not done any IOC. If we then look at the update film handler, this is an action which takes in an int, the ID of the film, and then a film object that you update with. That then calls an update film root handle method, which takes in the film ID in the film. It also wants a permission service or a valid user query. Here I randomly say the user is valid sometimes, sometimes not but it also needs that list film by ID func. And here we say return Pulp Fiction. But you'll see on the list film by ID, we also return Pulp Fiction. So we're duplicating effort here. So what you could do, if you look at the commented out code, is the get film by ID func. If you use that, you could then pass that to both these handlers. So you could share that code. Again, the create film by root, also takes in different objects, but also needs that valid user query, and we return randomly whether they're valid or not. Again, you could create a func or something to consolidate that. So what we can do is actually tidy that up a bit and use delegates. So delegates have been there since C sharp one, C sharp two, we're not using funks anymore or actions, we're using delegates, something that's been there for a long time. We're also using statics, which I think was there from the beginning as well. We're not doing any magic. But if we look here, we now have consolidated that valid user query. We use it here, down here, but if we go and look at the execute method on that, it's still doing the random stuff, but we've put it into one place and we can share that now. But effectively, that is a, a funk ball. But we've just um, made it a delegate. If we go and look at the list film by ID delegate, it's still a funk which takes in an int and returns a film, but we're now using delegates. And we can name our objects a bit clearly. So when we have IntelliSense and things like that, we've not got funk, 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 funk everywhere. So how would you test something like this? Glad you asked. So, again, we create our web server in memory. And we return an HTTP client. And our first test is to return a 422 on invalid data when creating a film. So here, second line, commented code, we've got no mocking libraries to fake the user valid query. We just invoke a func to return a true. So here we assign the create film handler in our root handlers class. We also call our create film .root .handle method. But from before, we know that that needs a film, but it also needs a valid user query or a valid user delegate. We don't need a mocking library or a faking library. We can just pass a func and say, this returns true. So we create our film with no name. We post it to our API, and we assert that we get 422 in, uh, in return. Because we've assigned this, which is normally done here, which would use your production code, we've assigned it in our test to do something slightly different we can then assert that the whole pipeline works. The same with the 403 check. If we create a film, we assign that delegate or func, which takes in a film, 
And it then calls our create film root dot handle, which takes that film. But instead of creating a fake func or a fake whatever, we just say return false. We even pass in a valid film, so it passes the validation. We post to that and return at a 403. Should get film by ID. So here, this one's got three dependencies. But again, we assign the delegate, which takes in an ID, and we expect a film in return. We call our production ready list film by ID root.handle method with the ID. But here, the list film by ID delegate, which is going to return a film for us, is just a func. It needs a director, we return a func, which returns a director. It needs some cast members, it's a func or a delegate, which returns an array of cast members. We execute the request and we then assert that Blade Runner has been returned, deemed by our func there. So that's kind of what I'm proposing. You may agree, you may disagree. <laughs> but don't take my word for it. So I mentioned Mike Hadlow earlier. His um, blog post is called Program Programming Entirely in Statics. I've completely ripped off his code samples and put it in my talk, so thank you, Mike. Um, Greg Young, he wrote, uh, sorry, he did a, a, a video, a talk at uh, Leet speak in Sweden a couple of years ago that I was at and he basically said design your code So it can be deleted If you can't recreate that code within a week, you probably over-engineered it to start with Mark Siemens solid the next step is functional in this blog post Mark talks about creating very small classes taking the s out of solid and making very specific classes something that hopefully I've showed today. Brian Geisler, beyond solid, the dependency elimination principle. Another talk by Greg Young, eight lines of code. I suggest you watch this. It took me far too long to go and see it. But essentially he says, try and keep things simple. It's a good talk, you will watch it and go, ah, oh, that's a good talk. And then over the days you'll then go, ah. you'll have a few light bulb moments. But the gist of it is, if you have a mock library, if you have an IOC container, if you have some other dependency in your production software, and that goes bang, what are you going to do? You're going to raise an issue on GitHub, you're going to wait for the guy to fix it, whilst getting screamed at by your boss. If you can write code which is simple, hopefully I've shown that today, then you've got more control over your software. Dan North did a talk on uh, why every element of solid is wrong at PubConf last year. There's some speaker slides there, which I suggest you take a look at. So, in conclusion, should you still follow solid? That's up to you. I would question what it gives you when starting a new project. Are there any alternatives? Hopefully there are. Hopefully you've seen this and thought, wow, that guy's amazing. He knows what he's talking about. And you go and have a look and put it into production. But hopefully it works. You have less dependencies. You have more performance. And you can then focus on your next problem. So thank you for your time. I think I'm a bit early. Um, the code is up at github.com slash jchannon slash t1000. Any questions, apart from him? Go on, then. Um, why T1000? Because the projects were morphed. They morphed from one thing to another. Clever thinking, huh? Any others? No? OK, well, thank you very much. Oh, OK. Yeah.